In a previous video, I addressed modern tone. And in that video, I mentioned that the reason why I like modern tone is its flexibility. A bright and stringy bass can be toned down to sound more classic. But certain instruments and string types can't be brightened to sound more modern because there's not enough brightness present there to work with. Now, I got some feedback from different folks about this video, and I would like to address it with a little bit of context. You see, I started playing bass professionally in the early 1980s. Back then, every club and every hotel would have a band five nights a week. Those groups were called Top 40 Bands, because they mostly played the Top 40 songs that were on Billboard's Hot 100 song chart. But that's not all these bands did. They also played popular songs from the previous decades mainly popular R&B and pop tunes that are from the rock and roll era, which started about the middle of the 1950s. So we were covering songs within a span of about 25 to 30 years, which is a very narrow range compared to what it is now. But even within that short amount of time, there's a giant difference in production and sound quality from the mid 50s to the early 80s. And this is especially true with bass tone. It wasn't unusual for us working top 40 bass players to change tones on our basses to better suit a song. No different than a guitarist using different pickups or effects pedals for different songs, or a keyboard player using different different sounds on his keyboards. Tone shaping on bass wasn't something that I made up. It was taught to me by a more experienced top 40 bass player. So after I did the modern tone video, I started looking on the internet and I realized that these type of tips and tricks that we used to do back then don't get talked about much anymore. It seems like these days that most bass players follow a set it and forget it philosophy. And that's perfectly fine. But I thought it might be a good idea to start making videos about tips and tricks that a lot of us working bass players do back then. Maybe you'll find it useful. And for this first one, I'm going to take a deeper dive into tone shaping. First is understanding the response characteristics of pickups and pickup location. And the general rule of thumb is this. A pickup mounted toward the bridge is going to be bright, mid-rangey, and often nasally. As you move that pickup position toward the neck, there's more bass response and fullness. But the high-end and mid-range articulation starts to disappear. <laughs> I can also apply the same principle to my pick or pluck location along the string length. If I pick or pluck the string toward the bridge, the tone will be a little bit bright and mid-rangey without a whole lot of bottom end. But as I move my hand neckward, I start getting more bottom end and fullness, but the high end articulation starts to fade. And the pickup type also plays a factor here. I've already mentioned string type and newness earlier. And finally, the actual tone controls themselves. On a passive bass, it's usually one knob that subtracts high end as you roll it down. And most active basses have an onboard preamp with an actual EQ. Now the tone shaping I'm talking about in this video is letting the bass do all the heavy work. But there's also effects and effects pedals which can enhance the emulations and open up doors to all kinds of sonic possibilities. Now I'm also going to mention fretboard positioning as a tool because where you play the note can also affect the tone of the bass. The higher up the neck, the warmer it is. Unfortunately, this tool isn't available for many important notes on a four string bass. But for tone shaping from the bass itself, the basic tool set is pick pluck position, pick up position, and the tone controls. Now I'll talk about how to apply these tools. Let's say I'm playing a bass with fairly new round wound strings. 
Because classic and vintage bass tones were warm and thumpy and didn't have a lot of high frequencies, this area, from about the P bass pickup position to the neck, is the vintage classic area. So if I want to use a more vintage classic tone on a song, if I use the pluck hand tool, I'm going to do it in this area. For the pickup tool, I'm going to favor the pickup that's closest to the neck. And in either case, I'm going to use the tone controls to take out even more high-end response. Conversely, if I want a more modern tone, then this is the area of the bass that I want to add. For pluck hand positioning, this area is going to be more articulate and brighter. If there's a pickup here, I will mix it in or use both pickups simultaneously. And in both cases, I'm going to utilize the tone controls to get more top end response. And you don't have to use all of these tools. For example, P bass players often just have that one mid-mounted pickup to work with. So it's not unusual to see an experienced P bass player move their pluck position or tone control to get different colorations of their bass. Now I'm just opposite of this. I generally like to keep my plucking hand in a smaller range. So I mostly rely on the mechanical parts of the bass to do all my tone shaping. I usually play basses with at least two pickups and very flexible tone controls. And there are certain emulations that have their own unique setups, like fretless basses. Now fretless basses are just like fretted basses. They can all sound different. But there is a well-known fretless stereotype. And that stereotype utilizes the pickup closest to the bridge and the manipulation of the tone controls. Effects like chorus and delay are also highly recommended here. Now I'm going to go over fretless emulation on my next video, so stay tuned for that. Okay, it's pop quiz time. Yay! Rib 13 is playing a hired gun gig. The next song is a popular R&B song from the 1960s. How does Rib 13 set his bass? The answer is, it depends. Uh? You see, the bass tone is just one of many colors on the band tone color palette. And it has to have the ability to blend with the other colors to make the painting work. There may be a color that works with some types of paintings, but not so well with other types. Let's say I get hired as a fill-in for a local variety band, and the keyboard player uses a lot of B3 and Rhodes on just about every song. And the drummer uses dark sounding cymbals and hasn't changed his drum head since, well, since PlayStation 2 was invented. And the guitar player uses vintage tone and has a Stevie Ray Vaughan approach to every song, then I'm probably going to stay with a more classic tone on just about everything. But if the keyboard player plays a lot of synthesizers, the drummer uses brighter cymbals and has fairly new drum heads, or especially if he's playing an electronic kit. And if the guitar player uses a lot of processing and approaches songs like Steve Lukather instead of Stevie Ray Vaughan, then I'm probably going to stay with modern tone on just about everything. A couple quick final notes here at the end. If you're going to do this, remember to try to keep all your levels consistent for every change. Also, a lot of us top 40 bass players back then were direct players. For many of us, amp tone and cabinet tone were never part of our equation. I'm Rib13. Thanks for watching. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. I do have a Patreon account. And as always, I would like to thank my patrons, Derek and Joe. And I'll see you next time.